It is amazing to be uh, in a new space and to have uh, this larger room together. And uh, I'm grateful for you all being here and for any new people for coming. And uh, my name is Rob Novak, and Chelsea and I serve with an incredible team uh, to help lead this ministry. And we're very grateful to be part of this spiritual community. And so I'm excited to get into the Word of God today. Y'all uh, want to hear the Bible this morning? Yes, sir. That's going to be great. And I know that uh, there's a lot going on right now. Uh, Friday night, we had a fun party uh, celebrating all of our graduates, our gala. Yeah. Uh, it was a great time. And even though we celebrated the graduates, I know that a lot of you aren't even done with your finals yet. Yeah. <laughs> so hopefully you do graduate or we'll be uh, <laughs> celebrating you again next year. No, I'm sure everybody... That was a... A great group of people we celebrated. I'm sure you're all graduated. You got uh, but I know for many of you, finals are on the mind. Uh, for others, maybe something at work or something with your family is on the mind. And uh, I just want to encourage you to try to be at peace with that for this next little bit so we can look at the Bible together, get some help, and uh, have some good fellowship and a little bit more worship. Amen? Uh, last Sunday, we had Sam Powell here, and uh, he did a, an amazing sermon on focusing on God's glory and living for His glory, uh, and that was a little bit of a detour from our series. Many of you know this year, we are studying out the book of Luke, Come on. really to focus on Jesus, His life, His ministry, who He was, so that we can know Him better and be more like Him. So if you could refresh your memory, two Sundays ago, Mark preached on the beginning of Luke chapter 4. And basically this year we've been slowly going through Luke, building up to Jesus, not only coming, but starting his ministry. And now the next major bulk of Luke is going to be us watching Jesus do his ministry. The next like three years of his life, Let's go. as he does all that he does leading up to the cross and resurrection. And so last week, uh, two weeks ago, Mark preached on Jesus, really as he was about to begin his ministry, he stood up in the synagogue uh, one Saturday, he was handed the scroll of Isaiah, and he read a section about the Messiah that was going to come, about the Messiah's ministry, bringing God's kingdom that was going to happen. He reads it, and then he says, today this is fulfilled in your presence. I've come to do this. And so... The Jews have been waiting hundreds of years for the Messiah to come. Right. And Jesus says, it's me. I am the Messiah. And just, you know, to explain, the Messiah was basically the promised Savior King that was coming. That was what the Jews were looking for in the Messiah was this promise from God, Savior, to come save them from captivity, from their sin, and to usher in God's kingdom. Uh, and to really rule as king of God's people. And Jesus is saying, that is me. Come on. And now there's got to be some proof in the pudding, right? There's got to be a little bit of, okay, you said you're the Messiah, now let's see it, right? Oh, yeah. What do you do? And uh, they, you know, didn't immediately accept him in his hometown. And so, uh, as I'm sure Mark preached on, at the end of that section, after he says, hey, it's me, He's driven out of his hometown of, of Nazareth. They shoo him out. And uh, where does he go? He goes to a region called Galilee. And many of you probably heard of there's a sea. Uh, there's a sea of Galilee. And so, maybe you grew up singing that song, right? So there's a sea of Galilee, and around it were a bunch of small towns and fishing villages and cities. And Jesus spent a lot of his ministry career traveling from those cities and around the Sea of Galilee, preaching, teaching, healing, and doing what he did. So he says, I'm the Messiah, I'm coming. He gets kicked out of Nazareth, and he goes to Galilee to start doing his ministry work. And in Isaiah, it said what his ministry was going to be, what he was going to be doing. It said that he was going to be proclaiming good news, that he was going to be changing people's lives, healing people's hurts, serving people, setting people free. That's what he said he was going to do. That's what the prophet Isaiah said that he was going to do. And now he goes to Galilee to start his ministry. And the question is, does he do it? Does he do it? Is he really the Messiah? So let's look here in Luke chapter 4, verse 31, as Jesus now practically starts his ministry on, Rob. and see what he does. You guys with me? Yes, sir. Luke 4, 31. Then he went down to Capernaum. 
a town in Galilee. And on the Sabbath, he taught the people. They were amazed at his teaching because his words had authority. In the synagogue, there was a man possessed by a demon, an impure spirit. He cried out at the top of his voice, Go away! What do you want to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Mm. Be quiet, Jesus said sternly. Come out of him. Then the demon threw the man down before them all and came out without injuring him. All the people were amazed and said to each other, What words these are! With authority and power he gives orders to impure spirits and they come out. And the news about him spread throughout the surrounding area. Jesus left the synagogue and went to the home of Simon. Right? Simon was also the same person as Peter. So Jesus left the synagogue and went to the home of Simon. Now Simon's mother-in-law was suffering from a high fever, and they asked Jesus to help her. So he bent over her and rebuked the fever. Don't you wish you could do that? And it left her. She got up at once and began to wait on them. At sunset, the people brought to Jesus all who had various kinds of sickness, and laying his hands on each one of them, he healed them. Moreover, demons came out of many people, shouting, You are the Son of God, but he rebuked them and would not allow them to speak, because they knew he was the Messiah. At daybreak, Jesus went out to a solitary place. The people were looking for him, and when they came to where he was, they tried to keep him from leaving them. But he said, I must proclaim the good news of the kingdom of God to the other towns also, because that is why I was sent. Right. And he kept on preaching in the synagogues of Judea. Amen. Does he do it? I mean, what an amazing window into just, if you didn't realize it, this was just one day mm. in the morning in the life of Jesus. Like, look how much Jesus accomplished in just day one of living out his ministry. First of all, he's teaching like they've never heard before. He drives an evil spirit out of a man, changing his life, setting him free. He's connecting with his disciples, right? He goes in and he heals Peter's mother-in-law. They eat together, fellowshipping, having a meal together. At sunset, the day's not even over yet. At sunset, Jesus is caring for the needs of crowds of other people being brought to him. And then he gets up early the next morning to spend personal time with God. And they come and try to keep him there, but he stays focused on his mission to go traveling to reach as many as possible. That's one day in the life of Jesus. Isn't that amazing? Yeah. And we get to see, well, how did people respond to Jesus' ministry? Was this a ministry that was like, you know, something they wanted nothing to do with? No, people responded with amazement at his teaching. People responded by being transformed spiritually, transformed physically, psychologically, socially, right? People went out and they responded by spreading the news of him everywhere they went. People responded by serving and giving. As soon as Peter's mother-in-law was healed, she got up and waited on them. People responded by being given and serving to the needs of others. People responded by bringing others to Jesus. If you notice it said, uh, after the sunset, others brought people to Jesus. Right. And so that was how people responded. It was like, hey, I got help. I found Jesus. Let me bring other people who need him to him as well. And people responded by getting up early in the morning, looking for Jesus. This is the way you respond when you see who Jesus is and you see his ministry. And this is the ministry of Jesus that his plan is to continue today through us mm -hmm. and the way that we should respond to his ministry as well. And what I just pointed out from this passage is a lot of stuff that we could focus on. And Jesus's ministry is a, is a multifaceted thing. But today I want to focus on one common thread through all of these examples and aspects of Jesus's ministry that can help us to live out all the rest of it. All right. And that one common thread is Jesus's word. 
Jesus' words. As those amazed in verse 36 stated, the title of my sermon today is What Words These Are. Right after they heard Jesus and, and watched him, you know, basically call a demon out of somebody, they said, man, what words these are. This guy can speak like nobody else I've ever seen or heard or met before. Yeah. What words these are. And you can realize in just this one passage I read how much Jesus' words are referenced. It said he taught the people. It said they were amazed at his teaching because his words had authority. Jesus called out the impure spirit. Again amazed, they said, what words these are. With authority and power, he gives orders. He rebuked the fever. And then he said the reason he came was to proclaim. That means to speak, to preach about God's kingdom. And then it said he kept on preaching. That's speaking. In this one story are so many references to the power and impact and the use yeah. of Jesus's words. Jesus's word hit people's lives. His words hit people's hearts. And his words hit the world with life, yeah. with truth, Amen. with light, with power, like nothing else ever had or has since. And my hope today is that you will leave here more amazed and impacted by God's word yourself. And that you would decide to live more personally engaged with and shaped by God's word in your life. Mm -hmm. That you wouldn't be someone who comes and hears the Bible once a week on a Sunday. Or maybe opens the app and just reads the verse of the day. But that you would become somebody who really lives shaped by and living by God's word. Word And that you would say, just like they did, what words these are. Mm -hmm. Now, that would be your conviction as well. And so I have a few different points to help us to live that. You guys with me still? Come on, Robert. The first point is that we need to be amazed at his word. If you're going to be shaped by his, his word, if you're going to dig into it the way you need to, if you're going to live by it, then we would have the same spirit they did here where it said twice that they were amazed by his words. Are you amazed at the word of God? Mm -hmm. Verse 32, they were amazed at his teaching because his words had authority. Mm -hmm. Right? What does it mean to be amazed? They were, they were blown away by it. They were moved by it. They were in awe at Jesus' words, at his teachings. It said they were amazed before he did any miracle, just at listening to him teach. And then they're amazed again after they see the impact of his word miraculously on somebody's life. Mm. But it said they were amazed because his words had authority. What does that mean? Well, Jesus was a rabbi. He taught about God. Other rabbis did not speak from their own thoughts or ideas or convictions. They quoted other rabbis. And so when you were listening to a rabbi, it would be normal for one to get up and say, Hey, according to Rabbi so-and-so, God wants this. According to Rabbi so-and-so, you should do blank. According to Rabbi so-and-so, you should whatever. And so the authority of their word was based on people. But Jesus came and he quoted nobody but God himself or spoke from his own authority. Mm. And so they heard Jesus speaking about God saying, Not this rabbi said this. He said, It is written. He quoted the scripture. And if he wasn't quoting the scripture, he was just speaking from God's authority as God in human flesh himself. And so people were amazed that, wow, Jesus speaks from his own authority and from the authority of God, not from authority of other people. You know, in their world and in our world today, there were a lot of different schools of thought. Different rabbis had different schools of thought, different people groups, right? There's in today's world so many different schools of thought, of ways of thinking about what's right and what's wrong, and what is life for, what's the meaning of life, who is God, right? There's a lot of opinions, there's a lot of beliefs about who God is, about what following Him means. There's a lot of different thoughts about how do I deal with different issues in my life, or challenges I face, or decisions that I, did, I need to make. There's a lot of different schools of thought on, well, what is right, what is wrong, right? And when we ask all those questions, we can get answers from ourselves, we could get answers from others. We could get answers from our culture or from tradition. And what we're going to find with all of those things is a huge mixed bag mm. of some things that are right and good, some things that are wrong, things that contradict each other, and a lot of stuff that just doesn't work. 
But Jesus spoke as God. Jesus spoke with a power and an authority like no one else and nothing else had. And what you need to know is that when you are reading the Bible, these are not some person, some man's ideas or thoughts. These are divine words. That we are hearing truth. We're hearing God's heart, who he really is according to him. Who we are made to be according to the one who made us. Amen, bro. And so with all the schools of thought out there, you should be living in God's school of thought. Mm -hmm. How does God say I should live? Who does God say I am? Who does God say he is? And what I've seen in my own life is that the Bible helps me to see the world, to see God, and to see myself clearly. Amen. And without the Bible, I'm, my vision, I might not even realize it, but my vision is foggy. Maybe I'm a little bit colorblind. I can't, I can't totally make things out, so I'm just trying to figure it out as I go. But when I get in the Bible, it corrects the way that I view God, I view myself, yeah. and I view the world. How many of you use some sort of corrective lenses? Glass, I mean, obviously if you're wearing glasses right now. <laughs> right, contacts or something? I'm not wearing glasses, but I'm wearing contacts. If I had my glasses on, they are very thick. I like seriously need, it is embarrassing how close to something I actually need to be to be able to read it. And you know, I might have told some of you this story before, but uh, one time, uh, years ago, I went into the eye doctor to get an update on my prescription. And so, you know, many of you have gone through this before. I sat there and, you know, they put the thing in front of me and up on the wall is the chart with all the different letters and symbols and different stuff like that. And you're taken through a series of first one or second one. And, you know, can you read that line for me? And for some reason, in that moment, I feel like my job is to get this right, not to be honest. I don't know if any of you feel like that. <laughs> like, I, I'm going to just try to make it out. It's like, shouldn't I be just saying, I honestly, I can't read that, you know? <laughs> but it feels like a test. You're like, I got to get this right, but I should get it wrong because then I'll get a better prescription. And I remember the one time sitting there and I could not make out what this one thing was. And so I'm like, A, Z, and I'm staring at this one symbol and I'm like, backwards Z. And then I keep going. And it keeps coming up. And I'm like, backwards Z. Backwards Z. And then when the whole thing was over, you know, they take the thing off and I put my glasses back on. I look at the chart and it was a three. <laughs> this whole time I was like, what an idiot. Like, my brain didn't think like, it's a three. You know, backwards E. You know, I just could not see clearly. And there, all these different lenses, it was blurry. But in a lot of ways, when we don't have the Bible fixing how we view ourselves, view the world, decisions we're making, is this right, is this wrong? Yeah. It's, it's foggy at best. You're guessing. You're trying to figure it out instead of just going, well, who is God? Yeah. Let me open up the Bible and go, what is right? How do I become a Christian? What is the truth? Instead of, well, my church told me this, my mom told me this, my pastor said this, my friend thinks that, this is what my friends do, this is what everybody else does. This is what seems right. I saw this on Instagram. All different lenses that are blurry, wrong, backwards, easy, and incorrect. Instead of just going to the Bible and as going, right. what does God say? On, what's actually true? What's actually right and best for my life? Come on, bro. Now, I grew up going to church every Sunday, and it did help me a lot to develop a baseline faith in God. And I'm grateful for that. I grew up with the Bible going to Sunday school, and I learned a lot of the stories. But I did not learn to live with the Bible as the standard for my life. I did not learn to live with the Bible as an actual resource to know God, connect with God, and then to live my life based off of. And so I knew the stories, but I did not know the Bible. And I thought I did. But when I was in college as a sophomore, and a friend sat down with me and opened up the scriptures and showed me what it really meant to be a Christian, for the first time I saw myself clearly. We looked at the cross for the first time I saw what Jesus did for me clearly. We looked at how somebody becomes a Christian, and I saw that I had never actually biblically become a Christian before. And it was like scales fell from my eyes, and I realized, wow, this book that had sat on my shelf, in my closet, read only in Sunday school or church Sunday, there was so much more value in this book than I had ever realized. And for the first time, I was living to actually know God deeply, and to live the way that he wanted me to. And all of a sudden, the Bible went from being a book of stories I knew to being a real life manual for how do I live righteously? What does God want me to do? Who is Jesus? How do I follow him? Who is God? The Bible became 
this amazing book to help me not just live like somebody walking in the dark, guessing, is this right? Should I do this? Just going with the flow. But somebody who was really living purposefully the way that God created me to. And that's what the Bible can be in your life as well. The Bible is amazing. And I know there's in this room a mixed experience with the Bible. Some of you have maybe barely read it. Others that grew up, maybe you read every day. And, and there's a whole lot of different experiences. But wherever you're coming from, there's a very real amazement at the scriptures that you should have, that you can have. The Bible is incredible. First of all, it covers every human experience. All right? If you're going through something, there's somebody in the Bible who went through something similar, if not almost the same thing. The Bible tells the good, the bad, and the ugly. It's not just a book of like fake in it, fake religion. It is, it is a book of people wrestling, suffering, dealing with, overcoming, great examples, bad examples. It is an amazing book of human experience. It is deep. It is rich. It is relatable. Right? The Bible is 60. It's not one book. It's the, the word Bible means libraries. You know, it's a library. It's a collection of 66 different books written by over 40 different people over a 1500 year span of time. And those people were shepherds, they were fishermen, they were kings, they were farmers, they were all different walks of life. And you've just got to try to wrap your mind around this for a second, that this book is 66 different books written over that long of a time by that many people that were totally different kinds of people. And a lot of them never met each other and yet somehow, this comes together as a cohesive unit supporting a unified message and overlaps and supports each other in ways that people are still discovering more and more of. It is a miraculous, divine book. Maybe you've seen this chart before. How many of you have seen this? Right? This blows my mind. On the bottom is every scripture in the Bible. That's why it's insanely small print. From Genesis all the way to Revelation, every scripture in the Bible across the bottom. The really long one is Psalm 119, longest chapter in the Bible. And what they did is drew an arch to connect any passage that referenced or quoted or was related to another passage in the Bible. Look how many cross-references are across the scriptures. Thousands of cross-references forming this incredible cohesive message that God is trying to get to you so that you can know him and so that you can know the way that he created you to live. The Bible has stood the test of time and more scrutiny than any other book has had to face and, and lives up against that scrutiny. There are no significant or proven real contradictions and it is so much more reliable than any other ancient documents that we have. You can learn about like the Dead Sea Scrolls and things like that that show you, wow, over hundreds of years, they carefully copied manuscripts to make sure that what we have today is reliable to the original sources that there were. And the Bible is amazing because stuff is written like the book of Isaiah was written 600 years before Jesus was born. But look at stuff that it says. Isaiah chapter 9, verse 1 and 2 and verse 6, it says, In the future, he being God, will honor Galilee. Well, where did Jesus do most of his ministry work? In Galilee. He will honor Galilee of the nations by the way of the sea beyond the Jordan. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of deep darkness, a light has dawned. What does that sound like? Well, let's keep going into verse 5. What is he talking about? To us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Isaiah goes on to talk about the son coming from a virgin birth. Right, I mean, who is this talking about? Right, if Jesus isn't this, then who, like, 600 years before he's born, the Bible is amazing. Isaiah chapter 61, he quotes and then he goes and he fulfills it. He lives it out. You know, it said that they were amazed at his authority. And I think part of why they were amazed at his authority was not just that he didn't quote other rabbis, but he quoted God and spoke for God himself. But I think what else was amazing about Jesus' word was he didn't just say it, he lived by it. He practiced what he preached. 
And so people heard a message from Jesus and then they watched him be it. They watched him do it. They watched him live it. Right? Jesus never sinned. So he didn't just preach about righteousness. He lived a, a perfectly righteous life. Wouldn't that give his words some authority? Like, wow, he is living what he's saying to do, you know? When Jesus was arrested and was under trial, they could not find anything to accuse him of. He lived a life that was under the public spectacle constantly, and yet they couldn't find anything. One slip up in a word or some, some slip in character, right? Or somebody that saw him doing something at some point, right? Jesus, he had authority because he didn't just preach it. He lived it. He lived it publicly and he lived it privately. In this story, we get a window. Oh, wow. Jesus is out in the crowd healing people. But then what does he do when he goes back in a private home with his friends, with his boys? He serves his mother-in-law. He goes and he helps her when nobody else is even looking. Right? And we think about, man, I could be one person in front of everybody else, but then who am I? Well, Jesus was the same person everywhere he went. His words had authority from that. He didn't just teach superficial things, act this way, make people think that you're this, seem this way, say the right thing. No, he was rejected in a lot of ways because his teaching challenged people to the core. His teaching got to who are you on the inside, to your heart, to your mind, to your relationships, to your life, to your faith. His, his teachings were deep and they were challenging. And so in that way, they had authority. And however familiar you are, I would encourage you to read some of Jesus' teachings. Read the Sermon on the Mount. Read Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7. And imagine your life if you lived by what he taught there. Imagine the world. Imagine a community of people actually living by Jesus' teachings. It would remove war. It would remove hatred. It would remove racism. It would remove greed. It would remove broken families. It would remove hypocrisy and religion. All the issues we see in our world, if people follow Jesus' teachings, he addresses it. He deals with it. Not from a law of, oh, this is a law to follow. He deals with it from people's hearts, the heart level. And that is why Jesus spoke as one with authority. And so this morning I want to ask, are you amazed at God's word? Are you amazed at how powerful, at how awesome, at how... The authority and, the, and the, the vastness and the, the validity of, of God's scriptures that there is. Are you in awe and moved by how amazing God's word is? That this came from God. Let's be amazed at his word. Amen? Amen. Amen. The second way that we should respond to his word is we should act on it. And so my second point is acting on his word. And so if something's that amazing, you don't just like go, oh, all right, and like ignore it, right? If something's that amazing, you act on it, right? Y'all know I like burgers, and so it's not a surprise if I get up here and talk about it, but I love burgers, I love making them, and I love looking for the best burgers in New York City. This past Wednesday, Yannick, Mark, and I met over here, uh, not even Wednesday, Tuesday morning? Oh, it was Wednesday. I was right the first time. We met over here. We, we got all these new chairs that we were able to buy. We had to wipe them all down and, and move them all in. And then afterwards, Yannick and I went to this awesome burger spot, Hamburger America. So I'll give it a little, uh, you know, so, what's the word? Yeah, some publicity right now. You can, you can go check it out. It, it's incredible. But I took Yannick there, and I, I don't know where his expectations were, but I told him this is going to be good. And he sat down, and then not just... Heard me saying it was amazing, but he ate it for himself. And he told me today he's going right back there to get another <laughs> one right after service today. Why? Because he, if he knows how amazing it is, you act on it. So he's going back and probably going to bring some of you with him. If you're like, wow, the word of God is amazing, you act on it. And I saw that in my life. When I started humbly and eagerly applying the word to my life, I realized it was even more amazing than I thought it was. Because there are some important questions that we deal with, yeah. right? Like, what am I here for? What is my identity? How should I treat others? What's actually sin and what's not? How can I know for sure that I'm forgiven, right? There's different layers of our heart, our attitude, our mind, our character that God gets at, right? There's application for every life and situation. There's these questions that the Bible answers, these things that it teaches that it's not meant just to be like quotes or theory. It's meant to be something that you act on. 
that you live by. You know, we see a few examples of that in this story, but one of them I'll read again. It said, In the synagogue there was a man possessed by a demon, an impure spirit. He cried out at the top of his voice, Go away! What do you want with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Be quiet, Jesus said sternly. Come out of him. Then the demon threw the man down before them all and came out without injuring him. You know, if we read this right after uh, what Mark preached on before, you would notice some intentional contrast being pointed out here. You know, right before this, Jesus was cast out of Nazareth by people there who would not accept his word and couldn't see who he was. And then in this passage, we're given the contrast of a demon yelling, I know who you are, Jesus of Nazareth. You are the Holy One of God. So these people who thought, oh, I'm familiar with Jesus. We know him. We grew up around him. I'm familiar. They couldn't see who he was. But then this demon said, I know who you are, Jesus of Nazareth, the Holy One of God. And then Jesus proceeds to call him out and free this man from this impure spirit. But the question I have for us to think about is, if the demon acted on Jesus' word, how much more should we? Mm, come on, bro. How much more should we who Jesus didn't come to destroy like the demon, but who Jesus came to save and destroy the demons in our lives? Wow. Like, how much more should we obey Jesus when he came to save and to set us free? Right? All of us have areas of our life our heart, our character, that are damaging or that consume us. Or maybe it's discontentment, broken identity, impurity, laziness, hatred, selfishness, substance abuse. There's many things that can be in our life that damage us, that hurt others, that consume us, right? There's, there's stuff that we have conflict with, things we worry about, temptations, Decisions we need to make, fears. There's a lot of stuff that fills us up or weighs us down. And sometimes there's things that you're not even aware of until you get in the Bible and you see, oh wow, that's something in my life that yeah. needs to change as well. And what we need to be sober to is the reality that not everyone who hears God's word is changed by it. Mm. So it's not like God's word is some magic, like, oh, you just... You know, take this and you'll be better. Just read it and you'll be better. There's people who heard Jesus' words and weren't healed, weren't changed. And then there's people who heard it and they were. How we respond to God's word makes the difference of whether it works in your life or not. And so you have to come to God's word with the right heart and the right humility. Good point. And what does that mean? That means something like this. Where you come to the Bible with the heart and the humility of is there something in the scriptures that I need to believe that I don't believe or need to change or something I need to do or imitate or something I need to trust God with or something I need to see in myself, right? That that's the general spirit, the heart, the humility, the willingness that we need to come to the word with if you're actually going to walk away impacted by it. Yep. The power is there. But you unlock that power through the faith and the heart and the humility that you come to the scriptures with. There are different responses, even in this room today, I'm sure, of how you're going to walk out from this sermon. In the Bible, we see it. In the world today, we see it. And some of those different responses are that some just don't want to hear what God has to say about some things. Just the hardness of heart of, I don't really care or want to know what the Bible says or don't see their need to hear what God says or anything wrong in their life. Maybe like the demon saying, go away, what do you want to destroy us? Like, I'm not looking to change my life. I'm not looking to, to get rid of certain things. I'm, I'm fine the way it is. And there could be a hardness of heart. And sadly, sometimes that's due to, like the people in Nazareth, a false familiarity with Jesus. You think, I grew up going to church. I grew up around the Bible. That's not for me. I don't want part of that. Well, maybe it was a false experience of Christianity. Maybe it was a false experience of Jesus. Mm. You know, it's a little bold for me to say this, but in my 14 years as a disciple and the many, many people I've sat down with, I do strongly believe that the majority of people who say they're Christians are not biblically Christians. The majority of churches that say they are Jesus' church are not biblical churches. 
Right? It's been 2,000 years of allowing Christianity to develop into something that is not what Jesus meant for it to be. Keep it real, bro. And there is still true religion. There is still true Christianity, but the road is narrow and only a few find it. And that's what this ministry is about. That's what we're about is getting into the Bible and being true biblical Christians. And so maybe the closeness is based on a false experience with Christianity. Right. And so I want to encourage you to get into the Bible and to learn, well, who does Jesus really? What is Christianity? Who, what does it really mean to be a Christian? And so that's one response. Another response is that maybe you believe in Christianity and, and you want the good of it, but you don't want the change that comes with that. Mm -hmm. Right, so it's like, yeah, I want forgiveness, I want blessings from, from Jesus, but I don't want to actually change some of these areas of my life that I need to repent in. Maybe trusting your own thinking on some matter, like, you know, I, I think this is okay even though the Bible says something else. The challenge with that is that you might be a Christian in your words, but not in God's word. Mm. And at the end of the day, you want to be a Christian in God's word. What does God say about what's right and wrong and how we should live? The truth is that you cannot truly know God. You cannot truly be a Christian or live righteously without following his word, without reading the Bible. As much as you might want to be or feel like you are, you need the scriptures to really know God and what he says about how to live. And so we need to take the whole package, not just the parts that we want. You know, the other response is maybe seeing and wanting help removing and changing these areas of your life. But you've been trying to do that on your own power and unable to really see success in it. And that's where I think the Bible can come in, that you're not just trying to change on your own strength, but going to scripture, going to prayer to really get spiritual help, divine help to change these different areas that you're trying to in your life. We need divine power. And that's where God's word comes in. What I've experienced in my own life and in many other people's lives time and time again is that when you come with the right heart to God's word and you really examine it and you examine yourself and then you faithfully live it out, it miraculously changes you. It changes you internally and then it changes you externally. And it's not magic, it is the power of God. And that's what the scriptures can do. Chelsea's gonna come up and speak a little bit more. Come on, Chelsea. Uh, well, I know I've shared my story with a lot of you before, but I am a preacher's kid turned to preacher's wife slash preacher herself. So my relationship with the Bible has been very complex. I've heard it my whole life. Uh, over and over again throughout my life um, but definitely when I was a young woman I realized like I know other people's opinion on the Bible I know the church's opinion on the Bible my parents opinions on the Bible but I don't really know what it says and when I actually started reading the Bible I was like um, so shocked at how little I actually knew about Jesus how little I actually knew about God and I became obsessed with this idea of finding God, of finding the truth. I read my Bible for literally hours a day. I would read before school, I would read on my lunch break, I would read a little bit after school, I would read before bed, and I started compiling like list of topics that I wanted to learn about in the Bible. Like I wanna learn everything the Bible has to say about anxiety. I would find every scripture I could on anxiety, write it down on my little chart, and then move on to another topic. Like I wanna learn everything there is to learn about um, sex, that was one. So like, let me find every scripture I can about like, what does the Bible say about that? And all, where, what does God actually think about that? Like, and put them on a little list and like, and, but it was so empowering to be able to study the Bible in this way because I felt like I am getting the untainted version of Christianity. Like, these are God's actual thoughts on this topic. And as I progressed as a Christian and decided to become a Christian myself, I kept doing this during different life stages. Um, when I was young and in college, one of the big, the hardest areas for me to figure out, like, how do I do this as a Christian, was dating and romance. So I had to do the same thing. I had to go find, okay, like, it's not explicitly in there dating, but, like, the Bible does talk about romance. Like, people got together in the Bible. Like, it's in there. So, like, let me go find 
everything I can on that topic and come up with like, here's what it seems like God is saying about this. Um, I had to do it with, for me, I've struggled for years with depression, anxiety, and OCD. So I've had to go for each of those things like, okay, where can I find examples of people who struggle with depression in the Bible, which there are lots actually. Where can I find examples of anxiety in the Bible? There are lots. Where are like th things that can apply to OCD in the Bible and come up with lists for those things? I've done that. Um, I've had to do that for marriage. Marriage is like way harder than it looks. <laughs> and uh, so I've had to look at like what is love and like what is actual love according to God. And I really don't think we would have a struggle with marriage as we have by far without the Bible. Um, and I do it with even raising my boys. I have two boys, most of you know, and with our eight-year-old boy, we had a, a meeting with the school recently, and the school was sharing with us, um, they were like, you know, I just want you to know, like, kids, this COVID generation of kids, they're, like, extremely inept at identifying emotions. Like, it, it's scary, and it's a pandemic in and of itself, they were saying. Like, kids don't understand the word no, they don't have boundaries, they don't know how to identify feelings or recognize feelings. They were like, we just want to tell you, Bradley is amazing at that. Like, whatever you're doing, it's working. Like, he is so advanced in that. He understands boundaries, he understands emotions, he can identify them in himself, and they were going on and on. And I was like, that's because Bradley knows the Bible. Like, that's because we're teaching him the Bible. Like, that's the only logical answer to that is because we have very intentionally gone after teaching our boys, like, scripture and understanding God and understanding, like, oh, you feel this. Well, here's what God says about that. Like, and it was so cool to hear that feedback on, like, how rare that is, especially for young boys to be understanding that and learning that. But all of those life skills that we, that I've found that have helped my life come out like semi uh, decent and <laughs> that are now helping my children and helped our relationship, like all of that is from the Bible. And what I found today is that it is so rare, like to find young people in the city who really know Jesus and really know the Bible and really know Jesus' words. And what I'm finding is that there's a lot of young people in the city who really are into spirituality and really are into like, no, I want to have this relationship with God. But then when you start asking them questions about, well, what does that mean? Or what does the relationship with God look like? Or it's very much like based off things that they feel or based off like concepts that they like feel like make sense to them or like based, basically based off nothing. And that's really scary to me. Like the lack, I really think it's so cool how many people we're finding who are interested in spirituality and interested in like wanting to connect with God, but it's scary the lack of like, well, here's what Jesus says. Here's what I know Jesus believes. Here's what, like that is very rare. And so we really in this room need to be students who know what Jesus says and who everything we're practicing and believing and comes from like, well, it says like book, chapter, verse, Jesus says this, the Bible says this, but that is so important to building a foundation of true spirituality. Because we don't want to just be spiritual, we want to be holy spiritual. Like we want to be connected with the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. So like we see in this story, I really want to encourage all of us today to leave here being people who have this heart and this humility of going to God's word and then acting on it so that you could see it transform your life the way that it's attended to. I want to give you three closing practical things that I want to encourage you to think about a plan for each of these this week to this week figure out how can I do each of these three things in my life regularly. Does that sound good? Can I give you three things practically? Yeah. And you know, that's going to be my way of very quickly summarizing this third point, attention to his word. We're amazed at it, we act on it, and we got to prioritize giving attention to the word of God. And uh, we see that in Jesus' example where it said at daybreak, that means when the sun rose, early in the morning. Jesus got up, went to a solitary place. What was he doing there? From other passages, it's very clear that he was spending time with God in prayer, meditating on the word, and getting in his personal time with God. 
And then they came looking for him, tried to keep him from leaving, and he said, I got to go preach other places also. And then he goes and he does it. Jesus, despite how crazy busy he was, made time to prioritize his personal time with God. That was his top priority. He couldn't live what he was doing without that being the priority. Setting an example for us that we can't live the way we need to without priority of attention. Because there's so many things that want our attention, that we want to give our attention to. But priority of attention to getting in God's word and getting that time with God. And so my three practicals for you to think about is how can you make sure that you get daily time in the word of God? Do you have a conviction to do that? Right after everything we talked about today and so much more I could have said, every follower of Jesus, every disciple in this room should have a solid conviction that you get in the Bible every single day. That you say, hey, Jesus is Lord. He's who I'm trying to be like and live like. Well, you got to sit down and look at him. Listen to him. Look at God. Spend time with God. Get direction daily, right? In Luke 9, Jesus said, you deny yourself and take up your cross and follow him daily. Daily time in the word. And so I want to encourage you to think about, well, how can you do that? What's your plan? When, when are you going to read? Where are you going to read? What are you going to read? If you're not sure, I encourage you to start with maybe a gospel, looking at the book of Luke or something at Jesus' life, but having a plan to read the Bible every day. Don't overcomplicate it. There could be special days where it's long and deep, but just something every day where you're reading a chapter or a story, read it, reflect on it, and then respond to it, right? What does this mean for me? What can I do today with this? And pair it with some time in prayer. And I want to encourage you to really think this week about how can I make sure I get daily time in the Word? What's my plan? And if you're not sure, talk to somebody in here for help on how to do that. The second practical thing I want you to think about is how can you make sure you get time in the Word with others who are trying to do that as well? God plans on this being a communal thing. You can't only do it with others, but you can't do it without others either. And so for somebody new here, I want to encourage you to ask about our personal Bible studies that we have. Right? We love Church Sunday, but probably the most important thing we do aside from this is personal Bible studies in small groups of two, three, four people to really dig into the Word. If you're a member of our ministry, you know that we try to have every person be set up in what we call a discipling group or discipling relationship to help each other. That that's something that gets priority in your week, that you reach out for, you set up time for, hey, I give attention to this, I want to get in the Word with others. And so think this week about not just how am I going to get in the Word every day by my own, but how can I make sure I'm getting in the Word with others, whether that's in these personal Bible studies or in your discipling time or discipling groups. And the last thing I want you to think about is how can I actively be sharing the Word with other people, people who haven't heard it. And you see Jesus in this story prioritizing that, giving attention to that, preaching the Word to others. And so praying for, looking for, who can I find to study the Bible with? Who can I find to bring to church so they can hear the word of God as well? Or whatever the best first step for that person is, is praying about and figuring out how can I have daily time in the word myself, make sure I'm learning from and with others, and then I'm looking for other people to pass God's word on to as well. So think this week about those three areas and figuring out how you can put those into practice in your life. Amen? Amen. Amen. I hope that this sermon inspired you to have the same heart that they did of what words these are. That you leave here today filled with the same spirit of being amazed at God's word. And because you're amazed at his word, you act on it. You live by it. You let it into your life and then you live it out. And that because you've experienced how amazing it is, you want to help give attention to it every single day and doing that with others and passing it on to other people as well. Let's live inspired at what words these are. Amen? Amen. Amen. Amen.